Hi everyone, so today we are going to cover semantic analysis as part of the CSC 307 principles of programming languages at Stony Brook University. So we'll start basically with what is semantic analysis. In the previous lectures, we talked about the grammars, uh, CFG grammars. Before that, we got, talked about scanners, which basically tokenize the input into keywords. Then with the CFG grammar, we recognize if uh, the syntax of the program is correct. We can basically write CFG grammars, which are uh, cheaper implementations of uh, general grammars. Uh, but they only verify the form of the valid program. It basically will specify what uh, the method definition is, we can specify what a statement is, but we cannot specify certain other things, like for instance that the number of parameters for a method invocation is the same with the number of, of formal parameters in the method itself. That is a concern for the semantics. Basically, we have to check those rules that go beyond the mere form or the syntax of the program, uh, which includes the number of arguments, uh, the types of these arguments, and so on. And this cannot be counted using uh, uh, the number of arguments with context-free grammars, besides the fact that methods can be defined in different uh, libraries, not part of the program that we are actually compiling, currently compiling. So the semantics uh, includes those rules that concern the meaning and defines what the program actually means, uh, detects if the program is semantically correct and helps it translate, uh, helps translating this program into another representation, one that can be executed uh, correctly. So today we are going to talk about semantic rules. However, semantic rules are of two, two different types. Static semantic rules that can be checked at uh, compile time and dynamic semantic rules, those that are uh, basically checked at uh, runtime. So following the parsing, uh, the next two phases of a typical compiler are semantic analysis, the part that we are going to talk about today, and intermediate code generation which is another part that we are going to talk about on Wednesday and we will see how to take basically the internal representation of uh, a program basically compiled by a compiler and translate it into a machine language level code like for instance an assembly code. In fact, many of uh, the modern compilers uh, mix or interleave these phases. Uh, parsing is interleaved with semantic analysis and intermediate code generation. So we'll see that when we write compilers in uh, Python using the classical Lex and Yak tools, which are the tokenizer or scanner and the grammar parser uh, generator, uh, we are going to interleave all of these phases into our grammar. Basically, we are going to generate the abstract syntax tree. In fact, we can also execute the, the program while we are uh, parsing it. We can separate the two phases, which is usually done for uh, programs such that we can execute while loops or we can execute any kind of control flow mechanism that we can uh, encounter in the program. So semantic rules, as I said, are divided into uh, two sets. Those that are enforced at compile time, those are called semantics, uh, static semantics, and dynamic semantics, which uh, basically are uh, pieces of code that are generated by the compiler to enforce these semantic rules at runtime that cannot be checked at uh, static compile time. So, for instance, uh, the user enters uh, or we ask the user to enter some values and the user enters those values and we use them for division. Uh, we have to check or we should rely on the hardware to check that uh, division is not done by zero, uh, that the bounds of an array are uh, enforced at runtime and so on. So the job of the semantic analyzer is basically to enforce these semantic rules 
logic static semantic rules plus to construct a syntax tree, uh, an abstract representation of, of the program and also to gather information needed by the code generator. In many cases it also does type consistency checking, uh, this is part of the static semantic rules and it also saves some information needed for dynamic uh, semantics uh, checking during runtime. So, as I said, all of these phases usually are interleaved into a single program, uh, usually a parcel generator that generates uh, code, uh, like C code. And the common approach is to interleave the parsing construction of a syntax tree with the phases in semantic analysis and code generation. And we do that using what are called attribute grammars. They are a formal framework for decorating the syntax tree uh, with uh, to construct the syntax tree out of the program. And this syntax tree is uh, decorated with attributes which basically stand for uh, either pointers or actual data structure data structures that represent the program in uh, some kind of uh, executable way. Now, these attributes are computed uh, either bottom-up or in another fashion and uh, the way that these attributes are computed is, is called attribute flow. It's the way that these nodes in the tree are actually decorated and it replaces the parse tree with a new tree called an abstract syntax tree or a syntax tree that reflects the input program in a more straightforward way. It basically eliminates the uh, parts that are not actually needed for uh, the program execution, like for instance parentheses or any other symbols that are, uh, not, re are not relevant for the execution of the program. So we also mentioned that uh, semantic analysis also includes dynamic checks. These are rules enforced at runtime. Uh, C, for instance, requires no dynamic checks at all by the uh, program uh, generated by the compiler. It relies on hardware for finding division by zero or attempting to access a memory outside the bounds of the program. However, Java, for instance, enforces as many rules as possible, uh, mainly because it's a virtual machine, it's an interpreter that runs on a virtual machine, runs the program on a virtual machine. So, in Java, for instance, an untrusted program cannot do anything uh, to damage the memory, it does not have access to locations or pointers, as a matter of fact. Uh, so, it's in that respect a little bit safer than uh, C. Many compilers generate code for dynamic checks, also uh, provide options for disabling them. We are going to see it in assertions in a few seconds. So, we enable during program development these uh, dynamic checks. Uh, they are basically checks added to the program to check certain conditions during execution, but uh, disables them for production and uh, in order to increase the execution speed. Now, this is considered by many uh, programmers to be basically a, a bad progress in practice because it's like a, wearing a jacket, a, a life jacket on land, but taking it off at sea. However, this is done mostly in most programming languages and we will see that the default uh, uh, setting for even Java is to ignore by default or disable by default all of these dynamic checks. So as an example of dynamic checks, uh, let's start talking about assertions. Many of you know about assertions, especially from Java, from uh, our computer science classes. Assertions are logical formulas written by programmers regarding the values of the program uses, use, uh, used to reason about the correctness of algorithms. And an assertion is expected to be true whenever the execution reaches a point in the code. So for instance, here we have a, a few examples. In Java, the syntax for writing assertions is assert and then a logical condition 
that is assumed to it's uh, expected uh, in order to for the program to be correct to be true if that uh, uh, logical condition is false then an assertion error exception will be thrown if the semantic uh, uh, check fails the syntax in C uh, is like a method invocation we basically uh, we have an assert and then denominator different than zero it's a logical condition again if the assertion fails the program will fail, a drop, uh, will terminate uh, abruptly with a message that that assertion failed. Similar to assertions, there are other uh, dynamic checks, like for instance, uh, some languages like Daphne from Microsoft, and we had a talk about that uh, last year, uh, or this year, in fact. Uh, we basically, uh, they support uh, invariants, which are logical conditions that are basically used to prove the correctness of uh, loops, of methods, and any kind of code. They are executed in parallel with the main program, and they pr prove the correctness of the program itself. So let's continue talking about Java assertions. An assertion in Java is a statement that enables us to uh, verify an assumption about the program. It's a Boolean condition expected to be true during ex execution. It, it, they can be used to assure the program correctness and avoid logical errors. And it, it is defined using the assert keyword and an assertion logical condition or an assertion logical condition followed by colon followed by detailed message, which basically is a primitive type of uh, or an object value that is used when, uh, with the constructor of that assertion error message that we saw before and here we have an example we write a program in which we sum the integers between uh, 0 and uh, 10 not including 10 after we write that loop we expect the value of i to be 10 that's when this program should fail and we expect that the sum is greater than 10 and less than uh, 50 when the assertion statement is actually executed, Java will evaluate that is assertion. If it's false, then an assertion error will be thrown. If it's true, which is the case in this case, it will basically be passed and the program terminates uh, gratefully, gracefully. So the assertion error is a class with no argument constructor and seven overloaded single argument constructors for the types integer, long, float, double, boolean, character, and object. And for the first statement in that example that we saw before, with the no detailed message, just an assertion, the no argument constructor for the assertion error will be would be used if the assertion would be false. But in that example, the assertion was actually true. For the second statement uh, with a detailed message, uh, the appropriate assertion error with object will be used uh, to match the data type of that message. In our case, the, it was a string uh, subclass of object, so it will use the assertion error constructor for object. Since the assertion error is a subclass of error, Again, when an assertion becomes false, the program will display that message and uh, it will exit. By default, all assertion act, uh, assertions are actually disabled at runtime. So in order to actually enable these assertions, we have to run the virtual machine with enable assertions or EA for short. And in that case, that program, uh, this program that we see here, if we have an assertion that we are expecting i to be different than 10, but of course, when we reach that assertion, i will be equal with 10. That assertion is false, and it will trigger an exception that there was that assertion error at line 7 of the program. Assertions can also be selectively enabled or disabled at a class level or a package level. And we can disable all assertions with minus disable assertions. Uh, they are already disabled by default, or we can disable only selectively the assertions 
in uh, class 1 but enable the assertions from package 1. Assertions should not be used for exception handling because they stop the program uh, and the program will exit. Uh, they are not exceptions, they are not unusual circumstances during the program execution. They are actually uh, checks that we are making for checking the correctness of the program. So as opposed from exception handling, which addresses robustness of the program, assertions address the correctness of the program. Two different features of uh, high quality software. So do not use assertions for argument checking in public methods because uh, if, they are, if the method invocation is valid with respect to the public method definition with uh, formal parameters, the contract is, must always be obeyed uh, based on the syntax of the program. Uh, it doesn't matter if the assertions are enabled or disabled. So uh, sh you should never write, for instance, such a method set radius in which we assert that the radius is always positive. This should be rewritten using exception handling. This class should throw an exception if the radius is negative. So we may we use assumptions to reaffirm uh, uh, we use assertions to reaffirm assumptions. This gives us more confidence that the correctness of the program is ensured. And a common use for assertions is actually to put uh, assertions uh, where we are expecting that uh, the program will be reached with a certain value, or the program is not actually reached at all. Like, for instance, let's assume that we have a month variable. We are expecting that month variable to be between 1 and 12. We are not expecting ever to actually reach the default case for a month that is different than 1 to 12. So in this case, I'm actually asserting directly false because I'm never expecting the, the code to reach this location. Similarly, if you have places in, let's say, a cascade of if statements and there is a point where we are never expecting to get to, that point should actually assert false and we should run the program with enabling uh, assertions to make sure that we find those points in the program. So, how can assert assertions are basically a syntactic feature? Uh, we add these assertions as, as checks checks in the program. But how actually can they be used uh, to actually prove the correctness of algorithms? So for that we are going to use what are called invariants. They are logical formulas which prove the correctness of programs. We uh, can specify as logical formulas the preconditions of statements and the postconditions of statements. And one of the specific cases of using invariants are loop invariants. They are logical formulas associated with the iterations through loops, which prove the correctness of the loop with respect to the preconditions for the loop and the postconditions for the loop. And we say that the loop is correct with respect with its preconditions and, and postconditions if and only if, whenever the algorithm satisfies the precondition for the loop and the loop terminates after a final number of steps, the algorithm's variables also satisfy the postconditions of the loop. So these logical formulas called invariants, if they are true before we actually enter the loop, they should also prove that through the iteration through the loop, these logical invariants still tra stay true and they also inf uh, imply the truthness of the post condition for the loop. So loop invariant is a logical formula with the parameter n, is a predicate with the domain of uh, a set of integers, which for every iteration of the loop, and we'll see that this matches mathematical induction that you learned in uh, Foundations of Computer Science, or discrete math. If the predicate was true for the value of n before the iteration, uh, after executing the loop, 
the predicate is also true for after we uh, exceed the iteration for n plus 1, the next step. Now, the correctness of the loop, as we defined it before, it actually uh, must satisfy the conditions before the loop it enters. So, the invariant i of 0 should be true before the first iteration through the loop. After a finite number of iterations through the loop, the guard g must become false, so the program terminates. The truth of the loop invariant assures that the truth of the post condition of the loop is also true. And then the loop will be correct with respect to the uh, precondition and post condition. So we have the base case in the case of i of 0. We have the iteration through the loop or the, uh, the fact that for every step, the next step is also true. And uh, the fact that the loop will eventually terminate and that the loop invariant ensures the truthfulness of the post condition through the loop. So let's take an example. For instance, we want to prove that the following algorithm computes the, uh, the product of an integer n with or a non-negative integer n with a real number x without using multiplication by using just addition. So the precondition for the loop is that we are given a non-negative integer m, x a real number, i equal with 0, and the product equal with 0. As long the loop uh, executes as long as i is different than m, the product is summed with the value of x, and i is incremented with 1. At the end of the while loop, we are expecting the result of this algorithm that the product contains the product with m of n and n and x. m is uh, the integer, x is the real number. And we can define the loop invariant. So the loop invariant is the following conjunction in logic. i is equal with n at every step n. And the product is equal with n multiplied with x at every step n. The guard of the loop is the actually condition of this while loop is the fact that i is different than m. So let's actually see if the, the conditions for the loop invariant are satisfied in this case. So basically the first condition is the loop invariant is true before the first iteration. i of 0 is true. So for i of 0, i is equal with 0 and the product is equal with 0 multiplied with x, which is equal with 0, is true. Before we enter the loop, the precondition of the loop is that i is 0 and the product is 0. Now we have to prove the inductive uh, step. So the inductive property is that if the guard was true and i of k was true before a loop iteration for any k greater than or equal with 0, i of k plus 1 is also true after the loop iteration. So let's assume k is a non-negative integer such that the guard and i of k is true. Since i is different than m, the guard is passed. So we execute the body of that loop. The product is equal with the product plus x. But the product was k multiplied with x plus x is k plus 1 multiplied with x after we give x as a common factor i is incremented with 1, so before i was equal with k, now i will be assigned k plus 1. Now let's look at the loop invariant for k plus 1, is that i is equal with k plus 1, and the product is equal with k plus 1 multiplied with x. That conjunction is true, so we actually prove the inductive step. Next, we have to prove the, the false, eventual flow falsity of the guard. So after a finite number of steps, the guard should become false. And we know actually how many steps are those. After exactly m iterations, the variable i will be equal with m, and the guard becomes false. This proves that basically the invariant is correct, and now we can use the invariant to prove that this invariant, uh, for this invariant being uh, correct, the post condition is also correct. So let's consider n as the least number of iterations after which the guard becomes false. i of n will it's true at that point, and from i of n true, we can infer that 
the variables of the algorithm also satisfy the post condition of the loop. So when is uh, this step uh, satisfied? After how many steps we actually have uh, uh, the, the guard false? The guard becomes false when I will be equal with M. So this uppercase N is equal with M. At that point, the, uh, the invariant I will be, the product is M multiplied with X and I is equal with M. But actually, the fact that the product is equal with M multiplied with X proves the post condition of the loop. We, are, we were expected, expecting to get in the post, in the product variable M multiplied with X. So that basically concludes our dynamic uh, analysis part. Uh, invariants can be used for proving the correctness of algorithms. Uh, they are also used for assumptions about variables in the program, like for instance, that the denominator of a, a, a division is different than zero, that the, uh, 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 that, that the ranges or the bounds of uh, an array the indices of an array satisfy the bounds of the array and so on. Static analysis, in fact, includes much more than that. Sometimes it may also include type checking. And for instance, in ML, type checking is done during static analysis. The compiler actually ensures that no variable will ever be used in runtime at, with an inappropriate type. By contrast, other languages have a uh, runtime overhead for dynamic checks. In Java, mostly typing is done uh, uh, statically, but it may also leave some dynamic checking for, uh, for basically casts, when we basically make or the user, the programmer makes an assumption about an object and uh, downcasts it to a specific class. There are other examples of static analysis uh, which we'll talk about later, like for instance, uh, alias analysis uh, determines whether a value can be safely cached into registers, computed out of order, or accessed by concurrent threads. Escape analysis determines when all the references to a value will be confined to a given context, allowing it to be allocated on the stack instead of the, on the heap. Uh, many programming languages promise not to do this, uh, mainly because uh, basically this will require, uh, in, although improves the efficiency or in certain cases it requires more dynamic checks, more complex dynamic checks during runtime. Subtype analysis determines when a variable in an object-oriented language is guaranteed to have a certain subtype and so that its methods can be called without dynamic dispatch or dynamic binding. Static analysis is sometimes all also used for optimizations and therefore we need also to learn the terms in optimizations. So optimizations uh, are called unsafe if they may lead to incorrect code. All optimizations that we have to, that we will make must be safe uh, uh, optimizations are called speculative if they usually improve the uh, performance of the program, but it may degrade it in certain cases. Uh, like for instance, non-binding pre uh, pref uh, prefetches uh, bring the data in the cache before it's needed, with the uh, with the basically not in, in an optimal case it would be needed, but it may actually be the case that it was not needed and then we actually have a decrease in uh, efficiency. Trace scheduling rearranges the code in, or in hopes to provide better performance. And in fact, when we talk about uh, uh, co control flow next class, we are actually going to see uh, a few examples of trace scheduling and rearranging of code. A compiler is called conservative when it only applies optimizations, when it guarantees that they are both safe and effective. And a compiler is called optimistic 
if it uses speculative optimizations, like it may generate two versions of the code with a dynamic check that checks between them based on the information available at compile time. So it will start executing one version of the code and if it was correct or the most, opt, uh, the most efficient of, uh, version of the code, but if the value is not correct uh, or uh, there was some special condition obtained, uh, executed, uh, it actually backtracks, rolls all the ch changes of that program and uh, tries another version of the code. Optimizations may lead to security risks if it's implemented incorrectly. And for instance, the 2018 uh, Spectre and uh, Meltdown hardware vulnerabilities are because of this kind of optimizations. Uh, they are basically the fact that an optimization may actually load values in the cache uh, memory, but the, uh, roll, uh, the rollback code did not actually uh, undo these this, uh, uh, cache registers uh, uh, allocations. So, in fact, it may le uh, leak information to other processes that are running on the processor at the same time. <clears throat> so, now let's talk about attribute grammar. So, there are many tasks that uh, semantic analysis does. Basically, it can do type checking, it can do code generation, it can do uh, uh, all of those optimizations that we talked about. But the main job of semantic analysis is actually to generate a syntax tree or some internal representation of the program that is directly executable. So this basically semantic analysis phase can be described in terms of what is called an annotation or the decoration of the parse or the syntax tree. So we talked about context-free grammars. On top of these context-free grammars, we add attributes. Attributes are uh, properties or actions attached to the production rules of a context-free grammar. And these additional actions uh, attached to the CFG, uh, context-free grammar, are called, in fact, attribute grammars. They are a formal framework for decorating the parse tree or constructing a syntax tree which basically uh, gives us, as at, at the end of the compiling phase, uh, a representation that we can execute. Now, these attributes are actually divided into two subgroups. Synthesized attributes, where the value at, uh, attached to every node in the tree is computed from the values of the attributes of the children nodes of this tree. And the type of grammars that have only this kind of synthesized attributes computing bottom-up from the leaves of the tree to the top of the tree are called S-attributed grammars. Now let's actually see an example. So this is a grammar. On the left-hand side, we have a CFG grammar that recognizes a sequence of uh, variables or identifiers separated by commas. So if we write the context for grammar, it will actually parse uh, expressions like a comma b comma c where id is a token that is detected at uh, uh, basically through the uh, code that uh, through the uh, tokenizer or the scanner that detects that any letter followed by other letters and digits and other characters like underscore are actually identifiers so the grammar itself, the CFG grammar, does not actually count how many elements were in the list or doesn't do anything but recognize the, the, the string that we pass as an input, a, b, c. Now, in addition to each production rule, we also have an attribute. Basically, the count attribute attached to L, the non-terminal L, is assigned one if there is a single ID. Or the count attribute for the non-terminal L is the count attribute of the non-terminal L and we use an uh, uh, index. So now we actually add an index 
This index is only added for the ex example here, it's not actually added in the grammar. But we basically add an index that we assign the fact that uh, the count attribute for the parent is the count attribute of the child plus one for the additional ID. So if we write the parse tree for uh, our string a comma b comma c, it will be parsed exactly like here. Uh, an ID is uh, it's not exactly this because these IDs should be each one L. So an ID is uh, uh, an L non-terminal. Uh, L is L comma another ID, and the same for the top. But in addition to that, it also computes this additional uh, set of attributes. So the attribute 1 is uh, computed for L, the node L, that is an ID A. And then we use that in order with the value 1 to actually compute the attribute for the next node uh, and the next node, the parent node. And in addition to this, there is a separate attribute flow. The fact that these attributes were synthesized from bottom to top. So up to now we don't have that attribute flow. The attribute flow will be added later as an addition uh, flow of information from the bottom to the top. Now if we would want to write this in ply, we learned ply is a lex and yak in Python. We would define two tokens, id and comma. ID is anything that starts with lowercase letters or lowercase and uppercase letters uh, and is followed by lowercase, uppercase letters and digits. A comma is just a comma. We ignore all the white characters. Uh, for every new line character we are adding one, but we don't really need to do that. It's just for uh, debugging purposes. Uh, then we build the lexer. So the lexer will identify the IDs. Like in the previous example, it will identify this ID, this ID, and this ID. We can define the parsing rules, and in our case the parsing rules are that a list is an ID, and in therefore T of 0, the, the attribute attached to the list is equal with 1. Another list could be a list followed by comma followed by ID, in which case the output attribute T of 0 is equal with T of 1 plus 1. And if we don't actually parse the entire input, then we actually declare a syntax error. Finally, for the string a, b, c, we parse this uh, tree and we get the attribute. And if we print that attribute, it will print that there were three IDs. And this is executable in Python exactly as you saw it. If you run it, it will basically print three. So if you want more about ply, you should go to our lecture notes for syntax, syntax where we actually define what ply does. Let me just show you where. So in our lecture notes for syntax, at the end of the lecture notes, we talked about ply. So please look over the ply definition and the fact that it basically defines the tokens and then it defines the parsing rules. We are just using them for as uh, semantic annotators for or analysis for uh, attributes. Okay. Moreover, uh, uh, semantic analysis is more than just context-free grammars. For instance, basic results in uh, uh, regular in, uh, uh, basic uh, results in automata theory and theory of computation tells us that a language like this one, n a's followed by n b's followed by n c's, which recognizes strings like a b c, two a's followed by two b's followed by two c's, three a's followed by three b's followed by three c's is not a context-free grammar. However, it can be captured using an attribute grammar. So attribute grammars, because of the fact they have, in addition to the uh, uh, syntax, 
also semantics and an attribute flow, they can be used to actually infer the correctness of, uh, of this language. And here we have actual the grammar. The CFG grammar is on the left hand side and each production rule is associated with uh, an attribute and uh, a rule that basically defines the fact that these attributes are computed and they are they are using the attributes computed for other nodes like for instance a's b's and c's to identify the attribute in the grammar so let's look first over the context free grammar so the context free grammar in this case uh, defines the following production rules with the root non-terminal g a, a node G is A's followed by B's followed by C's. A's could be an A followed by A's or Epsilon. B's could be a B followed by B's or Epsilon. And C's could be a C followed by C's or Epsilon. Now, the context free grammar itself does not recognize this language. It recognizes a different language. It recognizes the language that is any number of A's followed by any number of B's followed by any number of C's. So if we actually want to find out how many uh, that the fact that we have N A's, N B's and N C's, we must define it with uh, attributes. So we start defining these attributes for every one of the production rules. And actually, actually let's actually start from the bottom. So if C's is epsilon, then the number of uh, the attribute value, the number of C's that we see is equal with zero. If C's is C followed by C's, and we actually now use an index that the second C, C's uh, non-terminal is in fact uh, the, the one in the right hand side of the production rule, the value, the number of C's in the, in the left hand side of the production rule which is cs1 is the number of c's in the right in the right hand side cs plus 1 plus the additional 1 similarly we define the attributes as and bs for the other production rules finally the attribute ok which actually signifies the fact that a, a string belongs to this language L or not is a boolean that is the conjunction of the number of A's is equal with the number of B's and the number of B's is equal with the number of C's. So for instance, this will build such an annotated tree that from the bottom we can infer everything to the top again the attribute flow is always from the bottom to the top in this example that the number of a's that we see in epsilon is zero then uh, in its parent is one because we see one a followed by the a's which had value zero and we synthesize this value up until we get to the number of a's number of b's and number of c's and then we compare that a's are the same number with B's and the B's are the same number with C's. So the OK attribute is actually computed to be true in the root node. Now, with a CFG grammar, also the following string, which are three A's followed by two B's followed by three C's, is also in, in that language. But not with an attributed grammar. With an attributed grammar, in the annotate tree, we, have, we actually compute for the value OK false. And let me show you how this is done in Python with, again, Python Lex and Yak library. So first, I define uh, the tokens A, B, and C. And these are just the A's, B's, and C's that we see in our program. Uh, we ignore all of the white characters and all of uh, any other character but white characters and new lines will actually give us an error. We build a lexer before we define the parser. So in the parser, we attach these attribute rules. So let's actually see at the first. The first rule defines a statement or G as being A's followed by B's followed by C's. And the attribute that is computed for the, uh, the statement is 
a conjunction, the result of a conjunction, that the number of A's is the same with the number of B's, T of 1, which signifies the basically first element in the right hand side of the rule, is equal with T of 2, which is the element that signifies the second element in the right hand side of the production rule. And the number of B's is the same with the number of C's in a similar way. As we define the grammar, we basically say that the A's is the token A followed by A's, in which case T of 0 will be equal with 1, corresponding to the token A, plus T of 2, the number of a, uh, A's in the, sec in the second uh, element of the, uh, from the right hand side. If the number of A's is epsilon, then T of 0, the attribute attached to A's is equal with 0. And similarly, we have for B and C. Finally, let's say that we pass in 3 A's followed by 2 B's followed by 3 C's. And we parse that, it will basically, the context figure grammar will recognize it, but the OK attribute that we are assigning to uh, the root will be false. And let's see some examples. So again, we have it in ply. So here we have the tokens A, B, and C defined. Uh, we have the grammar with basically the number of A's is equal with the number of B's and the number of B's is equal with the number of C's. And we compute the number of A's, B's and C's with the production rules with annotations that we saw. If we are trying, let's say, 3 A's followed by 2 B's followed by 1 C, this will parse the input, but it will tell us that it's not, it's not in the language. The attribute OK is false. If we have a string that is in the language, it will parse it and it will tell us that, yes, this is in the language. Okay. Most of the grammars that you see in the lecture notes are uh, directly executable in Python. Uh, I just put them in the lecture notes so you can see more examples of using ply for any kind of grammars that you need. Now, bottom-up grammars for arithmetic expressions made out of constants and precedence and associativity can be written in context-free grammars. Uh, the grammar, again, says nothing about the meaning of the program. It only detects that the string follows the syntax of this grammar. But we can add these semantic functions, which are basically the attributes or the, the, the uh, actions that are executed while we are parsing the input. So attribute grammars define the semantics of the input program. It associates expressions to the mathematical concepts of the program. Attribute rules are definitions. They are not really assignments. They are not necessarily meant to be evaluated in any particular order or in any particular time. Uh, there are different types of grammars which dictate the order that these attributes are computed. And in most cases, we have actually only two types. We have S attributed grammars or synthesized attributes where we compute everything from the bottom to the top. And we have, uh, like for instance, in this example, we compute everything from the bottom to the top. So the attribute flow is from bottom to top. But there are also uh, uh, parser generators which actually distinguish the execution of the grammar uh, and the attribute flow to be also from the left hand side to the right hand side or from the top to the bottom in certain cases. But let's start with the simpler version. The simple version are basically synthesized attributes, attributes that are computed from the children or the right hand side of the production rule to the parent or the left hand side of the production rule. So in this example, we see that an expression is an expression plus a term. We actually we can write uh, a semantic function that computes 
the sum of the value attached to the expression on the right hand side and the term value and the sum of those is assigned to be the, the value attribute of the parent or the left hand side non-terminal in the production rule. Similarly, we implement subtraction, uh, multiplication, division, assignment of a factor to a term like a number uh, or of an expression within parentheses to a term or of a negative value. So, how do we evaluate the attributes? Uh, this evaluation of the attributes is called annotation or decoration. When the parse tree under the previous grammar is fully decorated, then the value of the expression in the root attribute uh, value should be actually uh, uh, present and can be printed. The code fragment for these rules are called semantic functions. They are not supposed to refer to any variable or attribute outside the current production. However, in most programming languages, you can do that. Uh, you can basically also assign uh, to variables, which are global dictionaries, uh, values, and so on. You can actually implement a very complex annotation mechanism in which you can also implement the scope of the current set of variables or the referencing environment at the current execution point in the program. Uh, in addition to that, in fact, most parsers also build a, a parse tree, a data structure that represents the original program in an executable way. And that is also done usually in the, uh, through an uh, action routine or a routine like a semantic function, but which actually creates uh, objects and modify objects in memory. And in many cases, it would use pointers to point to these objects uh, from the heap. Now, if we are given that grammar that we had before, that uh, an expression is a, a, a term or is a term multiplied with a factor and so on, or a term plus an expression and so on, we have to decorate the parse tree. And that, in this case, is done uh, through how the attributes are actually computed from the values of other attributes. In the parse tree that we have on the right hand side, I'm using curved arrows to show the attribute flow. Basically, each attribute is computed based on values in other attributes. The arrow, it basically signifies which is the input attribute and which is the output attribute for uh, uh, that attribute flow. As I said in the previous case, all the attributes are synthesized. That means that their values are calculated or synthesized only in the production in productions in which their symbol ap appears on the left hand side. So basically the left hand side symbol is based on values of the right hand side symbols. Uh, an S-attributed grammar is a grammar in which all the attributes are synthesized, and this is a case of an S-attributed grammar. So how do we implement that in Python? In fact, I'm doing more than that. I'm also recognizing, for instance, assignments of values or expressions to, uh, to, to uh, variables. So first, in Python, Lex and Yak or the Ply module, we actually define a set of tokens, name, number, plus, minus, times, divide, equals, left parenthesis, right parenthesis, and these are the tokens. The most interesting ones are the name token, which defines anything that starts with lowercase or uppercase or underscore uh, letters, and they are followed by either letters or digits or underscore. The longest token is recognized. Then we have the token number, which recognizes a sequence of digits, in this case, just an integer, at least one digit with no decimal point. 
and the value computed for this attribute is the cast to integer or to int of that string. We ignore all the white spaces and tabs and if we have any illegal characters we basically print a message like uh, illegal character and we signify that we had an error. We can also raise an exception if we want instead of just printing that specific error. The parsing rules in our case use precedence left for plus and minus with lower priority than times and divides. We also define a set of uh, or basically a dictionary of names for the variables and their associated values. And then I start defining the parsing rules. So the first parsing rule is an assignment statement. If a name equals an expression, then in the global dictionary names, we assign the value of the key T1, which is the name of the variable, is the value of T3. The value of T3 is synthesized from the value of the expression. A statement can be an expression, in which case we only print that value with a print statement, or an expression, and an expression could be an expression plus another expression, or an expression minus another expression, or an expression times or divide another expression. In either of those cases, in T of 0, the attribute that we, it's associated for the left-hand side expression, of all of these production rules is assigned the value of the first expression from the right hand side and the second expression from the right hand side with the appropriate operator. If an expression is a number then the value of the number is directly assigned to the value of the expression attribute t of 0. If the expression is an identifier and we want to evaluate it then the value of the expression is the value of the key t of 1, which is the name, in the global dictionary names. Finally, if we find any kind of error that we didn't expect, we, uh, in, the, in parsing, we basically print a message or we raise an exception. You can do that too. If the code was 1 plus 2 multiplied with 3, we can actually parse the code uh, to see the tokens. And this is a snippet of the code that actually for every token, it prints the token, the type and the value of that token. After which we parse the code using our grammar and we print the result. In our case, it will print 7. So let's see this code. This is the first example that I posted both in the homework and on. So the tokens have synthesized attributes because they are computed uh, basically from by the scanner. Inherited attributes are those attributes that depend on things above or to the left hand side of the parse tree or to the side of the parse tree. Like for instance, if we have this LL1 grammar for computing the value of a subtraction, this LL1 grammar should uh, basically uh, cannot uh, basically summarize on the right hand side of any subtree the, the value uh, as a single numeric value. So for instance, we know that this should compute 9 minus 4, everything the result minus 3. So we cannot See, uh, with a single numeric value say what is the result of this expression tail because we don't have the value of the original uh, value 9 in this case and think of the case that we can have min multiple minus values on the right hand side 3 so this subtraction is left associative it will require us to e either embed the entire tree into uh, an attribute that is a single, uh, that is a list, or uh, it will require us to pass the attribute for, from the left node uh, child to the right child, or 
from the left hand side to the right hand side in the right hand side of the production rule. So we can decorate left to right attribute flow past the attributes not only bottom up but also left to right in the tree. Like in this case, 9 should be passed to the left hand side in the expression tail and then it should be passed down during parsing to subtract from 9 the value 4 to obtain 5, 5 minus 3 to obtain 2, and then 2 to be copied and finally passed as the value of the entire expression. So we have an attribute flow that doesn't go only uh, from bottom to top, but it can also go from one child to another child in the parse tree, or from the child to the root, or to the parent in the parse tree, but also from the parent to the child in the parse tree. So, in fact, many uh, generators or many LL grammars have, uh, uh, parser generators have multiple uh, attributes or actions associated to one uh, parsing rule. In fact, in this case, one is used for copying the left context to the right hand side so the expression tail is uh, assigned the value of the constant so an attribute st or the subtotal is assigned the value of the constant and then the expression value which is the second rule copies the final value from the right hand most leaf back to the root and in fact these two are not executed at the same time if we write an entire grammar based on this LL uh, grammar, and this is just the implementation of that uh, grammar, it will compute this value uh, not synthesized but actually inherited. It passes from the left hand side, in some cases from one parent to a child and then get, it gets back the value from the parent. The advantage of ply, uh, uh, Python, Lex, and Yak is that you can actually write uh, such grammars uh, or you can write only synthesized grammars. Some, are, uh, uh, some parser generators like Java CC would require you to actually separate the attributes or basically the semantic rules into those that are executed from left to right attribute flow or bottom to top or synthesized attribute flow. So, as I said, attributed grammars are a formalism, but it doesn't specify the attribute flow. We call an attribute grammar well defined if the rules determine a, det a unique set of values for the attributes for every possible parse tree. For an attribute grammar to be well defined, it must be non circular. That's not actually enough for an attribute grammar, but it must be at least non-circular. That means that in the parse tree, it should never lead, lead to cycles in the attribute flow graph. So you saw those assignments in the attributes. It should never lead to, uh, let's say, an attribute A assigned to an attribute B and an attribute B being assigned, uh, assigned to an attribute A. That will actually be a circular uh, definition of the attributes and it, should, or it, it will not lead, lead to a well-defined uh, uh, parse tree, annotated parse tree. So how do we actually find the order of computing or synthesizing the values for all of these attributes? We can do it with a translation scheme. It's an algorithm that decorates the parse tree by invoking these attribute rules of the attribute grammar in an order consistent with the attribute tree's attribute flow. There are two types of translation schemes. An oblivious scheme, which basically just does repeated passes over the tree by invoking all the semantic functions whose arguments have been defined and stopping when it completes a pass with no value changes and the dynamic scheme which is tailored uh, basically tailors the evaluation order of the structure with the structure of the parse tree basically constructs a topological sort of the attribute flow graph and invokes the rules in that order 
to actually compute the attributes in one single linear uh, linear evaluation of the attributes in the in the parse tree. So there are two types of attributed grammars: synthesized attributed grammars, which basically or S attributed grammars where all the attributes are synthesized from bottom to top. They can be passed by LL grammars, LR grammars, and inherited attributes where the data flows top to bottom and bottom to top. So an attribute grammar is LL attributed if its attributes can be evaluated by visiting the nodes in a parse tree in a single left to right depth first order which is the same with the LL uh, or uh, parsing of an LL grammar. Now, in addition to compute, computing just a single value in the root, uh, a one-time pass compiler may also build a parse tree or a syntax tree. So it actually uh, interleaves semantic analysis with parsing. And the result is this parse tree where basically we have a data structure that stores the structure of the original program that we are parsing. And the attributes in this grammar are actually pointers to nodes in the parse tree. So basically in synthesized parse trees you have for every node you have a pointer to its uh, a, a, a syntax tree for the subtree or the parse tree below that node. It may actually contain in many cases just code fragments, in some cases it may contain pointers. In all of this case, if the semantic analysis and the code generation are interleaved with the parsing, then the action performed uh, uh, can actually generate code directly or can actually uh, generate the parse tree. And here we have an example. So we have a LR, a LL, uh, in this case is an LR grammar, which basically an expression is an expression plus a term. And now the expression pointer, which is the, uh, the right, uh, left hand side node pointer, is a pointer to a binary node for the plus node, which actually uh, has also additional pointers to the expression two pointer and the term pointer. So we can basically consider that an expression is basically assigned the pointer for, from his children and that child may be a term which is a pointer to the nodes in the tree that represent that specific uh, uh, node. So I did that same example in Python. Uh, by actually using object-oriented programming, the class node is evalu evaluates and executes statements, evaluates expressions and executes statements. A number node is a subclass of node where the input value uh, may or may not contain uh, the decimal dot period. If it contains it, that the value is a float. If it doesn't, it's an integer. In the case that we evaluate that value, it returns the value of that specific integer or float. A binary node is an object that contains pointers to the value, which is a node representing the operand 1, and another no, uh, pointer v2 to an operand 2, and operation that we want to compute. When we want to evaluate the current binary operation, Depending on the operator, if it's plus, then we evaluate the node v1, we evaluate the node v2, and the sum of the two nodes is basically uh, returned as the value of the current binary node. You see that we don't actually evaluate these values v1 and v2 in the constructor. I'm actually evaluating them in the evaluate method because this may be an expression in a, in a while loop. And every time it's called with a different value or uh, variables that may contain a new value. So we only evaluate lazily these values the moment that we evaluate the binary expression. Okay. So a print node, again, it's initialized with the value that gets printed. 
Again, we don't evaluate it on the spot, we leave it for later. When we evaluate that value, we actually print the value. And the truth is that this is not totally correct because we actually assign the value back to the value. So in order to be totally correct, we should just print the value that we evaluate without assigning it back because again, this can be part of a loop. So I'm going to do it on the spot. We print the value that gets evaluated. Now we start the parser. So up to now, we actually have the structure of the program. But now we can define the tokens, and in this case, it's a print, semi, number, plus, minus, divide, uh, and times. The number is a number that uh, gets a token that basically represents uh, a number, uh, a, sum, a number of digits followed by uh, digit dot or dot digit followed by uh, a number of digits or an integer which is just a number of digits not preceded by question mark uh, by uh, minus which creates a number node so in fact the tree is really a tree of nodes where even for numbers we are actually representing these numbers as nodes in the tree we are not actually evaluating them until we actually have to compute them uh, we build a lexer, so we can start writing the parser. The parser only contains plus, minus, divides, and times. And a print statement is the print token followed by left parenthesis, followed by expression, followed by right parenthesis, followed by semicolon. And the print node prints that specific node and uh, creates a print node. A T0 is assigned. Uh, a print node for that specific uh, node and we see that we don't evaluate anything in the parser we leave it after we actually parse the syntax tree a binary expression is an expression plus a factor you can replace factor in fact with expression and this is still correct because we have the precedence rules defined above as left associative we'll see that what that means in control flow I just realized why my example imply was not working because I opened it with Python 2.7. It will work in 3.6. Then uh, we have an expression. It could be a factor and the factor could be a number. We import the ply.yak uh, module and finally we execute it and we print the result of the parse tree. So we parse the program and then we print the, the abstract syntax tree. If there was an error either during tokenizing or during parsing, that will be a syntax error. If it was an error during execution, then it will print a runtime error. And execution actually executes that, that parse tree, uh, that abstract syntax tree. Any questions? So let's open it with Python 3.6. I'm more than confident that this will actually work. Yes. So let's run it again. I'm sorry it was not clicking to me what was happening before. Yes, it works. Uh, because I was I didn't notice that I was not using Python 3.6. I was using Python 2.7. And Ply works with 3.6 in my case because I installed it for Python 3.6. Good. So let's open it again with Python 3.6. And the program is taking the input as a string, as we saw it before, and it prints that specific uh, output. Okay, so let's return to the lecture. Any questions up to now? We went over a lot today. I want to make sure that we have no questions. Uh, 
I believe that the new lecture notes are actually part of the website, so... No. Okay, I will update them today, after the lecture. Okay, so the syntax tree can be actually computed either bottom-up, like we had it in the example, or it could be computed uh, uh, L-attributed, bottom-up and top-down, and two production rules, or basically a production rule with two attributes, uh, rules can be actually used. So, whenever it's possible to construct automatic tools to analyze the control flow and, the dec and to decorate the parse tree, most, uh, while it's possible, most compilers rely on action to teams, which the compiler writer embeds in the right-hand side of the production rule to evaluate attributes at specific points in the parse. So, an action routine is like a semantic function, which we tell the compiler to execute at a particular point in the parse, in an LL parse, uh, a family parser, action routines can be embedded at arbitrary points in the production production's right-hand side. So, the result of the action routines or semantic parsing in most cases is a syntax tree. It's basically a simplified parse tree where we eliminate everything that is not needed, like parentheses, or anything that is not actually needed in the program execution. And we can decorate the syntax tree as we saw before, either by creating the tree or by using a symbol table, a table that contains the variables. And in our case, I actually used a kind of a symbol table. In my example, I had uh, in both examples, in fact, I had a, a, a table or a dictionary of all the names used in the program. One more example. So the example that you saw earlier, uh, in fact, we have it in the lecture notes with a constant minus, a constant followed by an expression tail. We can also implement that as an S-attributed grammar in which we accumulate the value of the overall expression in the root of the tree. So, in this example, we basically have that uh, the expression value is the result of the reduce function action routine of the constant value and the expression tail value. The expression tail is, could be also minus constant uh, followed by expression tail, in which case the expression tail value is the constant cons, the value of the expression tail uh, to list, uh, or the expression tail could be epsilon, in which case the value is actually the empty string, the empty list. The reduce function is a function written in SML that basically if the list is empty, it returns the value, otherwise it calls the reduce on the value minus the head of the list and the tail of the list. Uh, I will develop uh, also an example for this one as a syntax tree and the attributes associated to every node, which you will, I will add to the lecture notes. So now let's uh, talk about the uh, homework assignment. For the homework assignment, what you should do, you should start from uh, the, two, the first example that I'm, I added, you can start actually from the first or the second example that I added in the expression grammars. So, f if you start from the first example, this will be a grammar that only works for homework 4, because it will basically evaluate everything from the bottom to the top, and we'll have a value, a single value computed in the root of this parse tree. If you start with the second example, this will be an example that this will be a case that you can use also for the next homework, which is homework 5, in which you have to actually implement uh, while statements, any kind of uh, languages that we basically 
require the execution of statements not a single time but many times during the execution of that while loop. So in either case, you can you have a beginning code that you can start with. You can start with uh, the first code or the second code, depending on which one you want to start with. Uh, now the two programs are actually included in the lecture notes. I will actually post them as part of the lecture notes uh, in a few minutes. And uh, they are both executable in Python. So for instance, you can start adding the additional tokens that are not yet described in the program. Like for instance, for strings, you can add uh, double quotes or single quotes for the string definition and then uh, or yes and then uh, you can actually parse those as inputs double quotes in our case and parse them as tokens and use them into the definition of the grammar so let's actually do a few of them like for instance define the token for string maybe define the list expressions and so on so actually i'm going to do a few of them for boolean, you have to add additional tokens. So this is the list of tokens that I had before. Let's add additional tokens. We will need tokens for true, for false. We will need also tokens for beginning bracket, for lists and for right bracket let's add them now so in the case of all of these tokens that we enumerated we add t underscore true is just a string for true in our language similarly for false In fact, you can actually, uh, you should also create additional nodes because this is the grammar that creates nodes. I will not do it now, but you can, you have to define them as uh, new methods that contain these tokens. So in fact, in all, instead of defining them as we define them above, you should define them as methods. So true is for t and it contains true and when we actually create a new node which the value of that node should be a new true node which you can define later or you can actually pass the value to a boolean node and assigned uh, to the node that you are going to create the value of that specific node. Similarly for false. Now let's do, parent let's do the parentheses for lists. So we have L bracket. It's a special regular expression character, so we have to escape it and R bracket now let's define the class for boolean nodes it's also a subclass of node let's define the constructor and the value that we are passing will be true or false. Now, based on that value, we can actually set the value of the current object. So again, if the value is true, then the value of self is true. 
else the value of self is false. And when we evaluate it, we return the value of that specific node. Good. So now let's actually define the grammar for lists. So we have expressions below here. Let's define a new parsing rule for lists a list could be an, ex an expression could be a list and the list starts with L bracket and then we are going to have the elements inside the list followed by R bracket And in that case, t of 0 is the result of this in list uh, non terminal. So it will be t of 1. So now we can define a new method for in list. So an in list. can be either just one element, which is an expression, in which case t of 0 is the list formed out of t of 1, or it could be an expression preceded by another in list in which case t of 0 is t of 1 concatenated with t of 2 now this evaluates the list on the spot so this is actually executable and fine in in the first grammar but in this grammar a better implementation would actually to also create a, a specific node for lists. So let's do it that way. So a list node could actually take the value of the node and the value of the node is the value of that node in a list. And then we have access to that list. So let's actually modify our grammar for in lists that a list that has a single expression is not just the list that contains t of 1, but a new list node for t of 1. And T of 0 in this case is T of 1 dot V dot append the value of the expression, which is T of 2. So this will actually create a list node and pass it as the value of the expression. Now, there are there is debugging that needs to be done and I will do it in a few moments. For the moment, I will save the lecture notes for all of your colleagues that uh, are not here today. Okay. So there are a few issues. Yes, you are right. I will actually uh, go over the program and debug it in a few minutes. Uh, but let's first save the lecture notes for your colleagues.